In our next module, we're going to talk about Cisco ACI fabric operations and forwarding. So for an agenda, we'll take a look first at why VXLAN. We'll do a whiteboarding session with this. Next, we'll take a look at what is virtual extensible LAN or VXLAN, kind of go over the basics. We'll then take a look at the ACI fabric fundamentals, how traffic is forwarded on the fabric, how endpoints are learned and looked up, and some fabric innovations that ACI provides that give us a amazing strategic advantage. So first of all, let's go to our whiteboard. So if we begin taking a look at legacy network design, probably about 15 or so years ago, we started designing networks in this three-tier architecture. And we would have our core, we would have our distribution, or sometimes called the aggregation layer, and we would have our access layer. Of course, in smaller environments, or sometimes people would do this anyway, we would have a collapsed core, where basically the core and distribution would be one and the same. If they were separate, then typically there was L3 routed links between the core and the distribution. And then whether they were collapsed or whether we did not have uh, the collapse between the distribution and the access layer, we were L2. And the idea was to allow uh, portability. Well, not just portability, but the ability to scale out, to have multiple uh, machines, whether they were bare metal or virtual machines, not only on one particular switch, access switch, but also on another particular access switch. And of course, this VLAN would at L2 be able to trunk, using dot one q trunk across the layer two links. Now, what were some of the problems of this old architecture? Some of the problems were things like our good old friend, spanning tree protocol. So with spanning tree protocol, what we would typically do is, because this would block links, right, the idea was to allow us to have a redundant architecture. So we see a triangle here, and I'm not going to get into the specifics, but it was always best to build spanning tree in triangles, not squares. There's a lot of good reasons that you can check out if you're interested in things like Cisco Live, uh, a lot of their online free uh, learning sessions. They go into a lot of good sessions on why triangles, not squares, for spanning tree. But at any rate, we would have redundancy in our L2 links. Now, of course, because of the way that MAC addresses are learned and how switches forward traffic, which we'll talk about here in a moment, because we're going to contrast that with how they're learned and forwarded in VXLAN and specifically in ACI, because of the way that MAC addresses were learned, we could not have all active paths in this uh, loop for L2. So what spanning tree, our good friend spanning tree, would do is it would go ahead and it would block a particular link. So because it would block a link, let's say on every L2 switch going to uh, this distribution switch one, and then we Let's say we have distribution switch one and distribution switch two. Let's say we're blocking all the links from our access on link one going up to distro one. Now, the problem is we only have half of our bandwidth. So if these were one gig links, if they were 10 gig links, if they were 40 or 100, doesn't matter. We have redundant links, but only one of them is forwarding because the other is blocked. So because of this, what we would typically do is divide our VLANs up into two groups, whether we chose to use rapid per VLAN spanning tree, or whether we chose to use multiple spanning tree, which groups VLANs into instances. We would typically have two instances. And if we had rapid per VLAN spanning tree, we would simply have the number of VLANs that we had that's a lot of overhead and processing for the switch to do. Uh, and some switches, especially the lower access switches, do have limitations on how many VLAN, uh, really how many VLANs they can have, uh, or at least how many spanning tree processes they can have. So regardless of whether we were using rapid 
or MST, we would group our VLANs into two groups. So let's say we would have the red group of VLANs, kind of more of a kind of more of a peach color. And let's highly contrast that with a green set of VLANs. So at this point, our red set of VLANs, actually, since I have the green color, let's say our green is traversing this link. And we have spanning tree. Uh, we're using path cost and poisoning this link up to two. And we would do this on every access switch. So that way, our green set of VLANs would always flow up the first link. And we would probably make this the root bridge. Distribution 1 would be the root for those VLANs from a spanning tree bridge perspective. And so this would be the root port. And this would essentially be an alternate port, but I'm not going to write the A. Okay, So this would be the root port, root port, root port. Then, if I can find the same color again, for our kind of, call it red, beige VLANs or something, uh, we would have those would be forwarding up the second link. So this would be the root port, because we would go ahead and set this as the root bridge. And this gave us uh, at least the ability to use all of our links forwarding because we had broken up the layer 2 loop for each VLAN. But the problem is we called this kind of load balancing, but was it really load balancing? It really wasn't load balancing, was it? Why wasn't it load balancing? Well, because if, let's say, this set of VLANs all of a sudden has a bunch of elephant flows or a higher amount of traffic than, than the VLANs that are the green you know, group of VLANs, then this link would be overwhelmed here, but this link would remain somewhat dormant or at least less utilized. So it wasn't true load balancing in any way. Plus, we had to deal with spanning tree issues. We had to set uh, root guard. We had to set so that you know other switches, maybe we would set root guard here and here, et cetera, on all the links from the distribution switches. Actually, since I have that color, it would be root guard would be here. And we'd even set root guard here. And the idea would be to prevent uh, another switch from becoming root. We'd set loop guard. We'd set uh, spanning tree BPDU guard down here facing to the server. So they couldn't uh, send in spanning tree BPDUs. And if they did, they would go into error disable. We might even have to set spanning tree BPDU filter to mitigate some issues with spanning tree if we ever needed to do so, especially with fexes or um, hopefully not. But between data centers, at any rate, let's go on. So this was obviously troublesome, right? A little bit problematic. So what we did was instead, we moved to a little bit more of a model whereby we began using either VSS or VPC. Uh, really, this has been around for many years. I think Nortel had the first uh, Passport 8600 switch that could do what was industry called MLAG, multi-chassis link aggregation. So we began using, let's just say these are all VPCs. So here we have our VPC peer links between these two switches that look like one. Here we have a VPC peer link between these two switches that look like one. And then all of these links, whether we have four or 16, can all be a part of one port channel. And it basically, from a logical standpoint, it looks like this. It looks like we have one switch connected to one switch with one link. From a spanning tree perspective, let's say this was the root. And this would be the root port pointing to the root bridge. And so it would be forwarding. So this was great. This eliminated a lot of our spanning tree issues because now, uh, our L2 was all a single port, but our L and our L3 didn't use spanning tree. We just used equal cost multipath routing. So this was great, but now we had to deal with VPC or VSS uh, failure scenarios. So what happens if we lose the peer link? Well, all of our secondary, let's say this is primary, and this is our secondary, all of the secondary member ports are going to shut down. 
The SVI might shut down unless we exclude it. Orphan ports, if we have any, especially maybe let's say from this perspective here, let's say primary and secondary, we lose the VPC peer link, we shut down member ports. We do not shut down orphan ports un or suspend them unless we specifically state so. We have all of these failure scenarios that we have to account for. So it's better, but it's not perfect. Okay, so at this point, we began moving to more of a CLOS topology. So we talked or introduced the term CLOS or spine leaf fabric, and we did so with things like fabric path. Now actually, before we do this, let's go back. And one thing I forgot to mention on the first scenario is how do we learn MAC addresses? So how do MAC addresses show up? Let's say I have MAC A, B, C, and D. So I'm not going to use all of the MACs, but this access switch 1 learns MAC address A. Let's say that this is the blocking link. So uh, distribution switch 2 learns MAC address A, and specifically it learns that it's on this port right here. Distribution switch 1 learns of MAC address A, and it learns that it's on this port right here. Then all of our other switches, let's just put in some spanning tree blocking links. Okay, so all of our other switches are going to learn MAC address A on this port. And all switches are going to learn all MAC addresses. Now, what happens when spanning tree has a topology change. It sends topology change notifications. Okay, so let's say all of a sudden we lose a link and let's, uh, let's choose a different color so it stands out a little bit more. So we lose a link and then all of a sudden this link that was down actually goes now into forwarding mode. So it begins to forward, and now traffic is going across this link. Well, all of the CAM tables for that particular VLAN are going to flush, and they're going to have to relearn their MAC addresses. So the first problem is CAM table exhaustion from a MAC address or overwhelming MAC address issue. So we have a scalability issue in that our smaller access switches may not have as much CAM space, of course they would not, as our larger modular uh, distribution or possibly even you know, collapsed core switches would. So that's the first thing. The second thing is TCNs are going to wreak havoc. So what happens when a TCN uh, occurs? Well, we already talked about it's going to flush the MAC table, but let's say that host A has already ARPed for host uh, B. So it already knows that, let's say, IP2 equals B. Okay? So IP2, this is IP1, and this is IP2 over here. So IP2 already equals uh, B, MAC address B. So it goes to send traffic to B, and this switch says, I don't have B in my table. Well, now maybe it's already relearned it, uh, but maybe it hasn't yet relearned it. So it might need to, in certain scenarios, send an unknown unicast, which is another kind of flood. So we have ARP flooding, we have unknown unicast flooding as well that could occur. So this is really not an ideal scenario from a TCAM exhaustion standpoint and how scalable, how large we can have, especially as we grow to, let's say, 100,000 VMs, as well as from a constant CPU and memory issue with floods, TCN, topology change notification, our CAM table flush for a given VLAN, uh, broadcast, things of that nature. Okay. So now we can go ahead and go back. And now what we'll do is we'll talk about a more modern architecture with our CLOS 
fabrics. So we started out with Trill. And of course, really, not really many vendors adapted Trill. Instead, they had their own uh, proprietary, which you know, was supposed to be better than, than Trill. Uh, Cisco had Fabric Path, which eventually became uh, DFA, Dynamic Fabric Automation, with a BGP control plane. But it was still based on this class topology. Now, Fabric Path, or DFA, uh, everything was L2, actually, not L3. And we actually used the IS to IS routing protocol, which was not built primarily for IP, but for the old CLNS networks, which had a layer 3 component, but it also had a layer 2 routing component. So we actually did routing for Fabric Path at layer 2. So we'll move beyond Fabric Path. There are some similarities to Fabric Path and ACI, but uh, we'll, we'll pretty much just focus on VXLAN now. So in VXLAN, the idea is we still want to use a layer 3, fully layer 3 fabric or set of links between our two tiers, our leaf and our spine. But at this point, uh, and, and we really could use probably any routing protocol, uh, it actually could be even uh, just pure BGP. Uh, we won't go into that design. Uh, we could even use OSPF. Uh, ACI does use IS to IS, so intermediate system to intermediate system. And it does so from a layer three routing perspective. So we saw Fabric Path used ISIS, but at layer two. So everything is full layer three routed, as I mentioned, between the leaf and the spines. So what does this mean? Well, what if I have a host, let's say MAC address A, that needs to talk to MAC address D over here? We have a layer 2 link indicated by blue, okay, our VPC link. So we can go up to either switch at layer 2, but layer 2 dies there, and we have to route. So how could uh, a be on, let's say, 10.1.1.0 slash 24, and D also be on 10.1.1. Let's just give this the IP of dot 4 slash 24, and we'll give this the IP address of dot 1. Our default gateway is 254 in this example. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, we're going to use VXLAN, of course. So VXLAN is going to see either the raw Ethernet frame or the dot .1Q header that comes in to the leaf switch. And of course, there's going to be a mapping that we've already talked about from the VLAN to the EPG. So we're going to see the VLAN or possibly just the single port. And that's going to be translated and mapped into the layer 2 VXLAN, specifically the VNI, the VXLAN network identifier. Now from there, the VXLAN, and we're getting ready to talk about the header format, but we basically preserve all of the existing L2 and L3 header information that came from our southbound host and we're going to encapsulate that in VXLAN and add a new L2 and L3 header. Now the destination IP, the destination IP of the L3 will be the VTEP of the switch that actually owns MAC address D. And we'll be talking about how this looks how the fabric learns the IP addresses in some upcoming slides. So I'm going to go ahead and reserve that for right now. But suffice it to say, this leaf switch 1 will know that leaf 4, or at least have the ability to find out, that leaf 4 owns MAC address D and even owns the IP address 10114. So it will make its destination IP the VTEP. The source IP 
will be, so this is L4 VTEP. And the source IP will be the LEAF1 VTEP, basically where the packet came from, okay, where the VXLAN packet was originated from. So in ACI, we said that these are going to be their loopback zero interface. Okay, so what do we get with this? Well, if this is 40 gig or 100 gig or in the future, 400 gig, doesn't really matter. Uh, I have equal cost multipath. So if I have two spines and this is 40 gig, I have 80 gig of forwarding capacity per leaf to any other leaf. And I only have one spine hop to get to it, right? So ECMP, equal cost multipath, we're going to use our hashing algorithm. And for any given single flow, it's going to always choose one link. Another flow could go over another link. Now we're going to talk the very, pretty much the second to last slide in this module about, uh, and this module will probably be pretty long, so it'll probably be broken down into separate parts. But uh, so if you're kind of watching this, if you skip forward to the end and you don't see this, uh, go ahead and check out there might be a part two or a part three. One of the things that we'll talk about second to last slide in this module is ACI can actually break up flows safely while still preserving in order delivery so as not to have to deal with TCP retransmits and window size scaling. But we could even take a single flow and break it up and send it over multiple links. So how do we increase in bandwidth without upgrading the number uh, or sorry the type of interface, SFP, or fiber. And by the way, I should note, of course, that the 40 gig fiber uh, uses BiDi optics. And so we can use our existing OM2 uh, or 3 cable plan to get the 40 gig bandwidth. So wh what we can do is we can scale out additional spines. So if I add another spine, then I have another 40 gig link for every leaf switch. And the idea with the clause topology, this is getting a little crowded, the idea with the clause topology is that we would have every leaf is connected to every spine. That way, if I have another spine, it's connected there. If I have another spine, it's connected there. So everyone is connected everywhere. for a fully meshed fabric. So that's certainly one way to grow bandwidth. The other way is I, if I have additional ports on my existing spine switches, then I can go ahead and add multiple links. And I don't even have to add them equally. So I could just add, it's not a good idea, but you could even just add uh, one link from, let's say, leaf uh, one to spine one on one or every leaf switch, and it's going to produce the same results in the sense that we're still going to get equal cost multipath from a layer three perspective, so it's actually not going to cause any unequal distribution or problems. And then if we had a spine failure, the problem is if we had a spine failure, we would lose, uh, instead of half our bandwidth, in this particular example, we would lose two thirds of our bandwidth. So here, and we're probably going to design so that we only need one uh, spine, or I should say half of our spines to be up, or really n minus one, so that if we, let's say if we have three, and we need 80 gig of bandwidth, we have three spines, then at this point, if we lose any one spine, then we're only going to ever lose one third of our bandwidth, and we calculated or planned for no oversubscription beyond two links, okay, or 80 gig even though we had 120 gig. So that's one thing from a quick design perspective. But we can add multiple links. So I could add, let's say, two links from leaf one to each spine, from leaf two to each spine, whoops, from leaf three to each spine, from leaf four to each spine, five to each spine, and six to each spine. And now I just upgraded my entire fabric without even adding more switches just some bidioptics and fiber to uh, four times 40 
gig or 160 gig. Now this is, I, I drew a, a circle here only to say these are the links, not port channel. So these would not be port channeled. They would still be L3 ECMP from a routing perspective. So ISIS would have essentially four uh, links, four possible paths in its forwarding base for any given IP address or even MAC address from a VXLAN perspective. Of course, it's only going to be routing the VXLAN VTEP header. Uh, the MAC address is just going to be learned and mapped to an egress VTEP. Okay, so one of the other things with ACI that we talked about early on and that the miscabling protocol prevents us from doing is possibly connecting two spines together. This is not allowed and these links would be detected through LLDP. Now, in the fabric, and again, this portion here from the leaf to the south, that's the access or access policies, okay? And then from the spine to the leaf, this is the fabric. So anywhere in the fabric where it detects a failure, actually, first of all, anywhere in the fabric, it's always running LD LLDP and you cannot turn it off. You could turn it off from a southbound perspective. You could turn LLDP off, uh, but you cannot turn it off in the fabric. It's always running it. And so this is how it will detect using special ACI type length values. It's going to detect any miscabling. So leaf to leaf communication. Let me just go ahead and clean this up a little bit. It's going to detect leaf to leaf communication and shut those ports down. Spine to spine, shut those ports down. Spine to host and shut that port down. So all of those it's going to shut down. Now you may say, well, wait a minute. If I have, let's say, modular spine switches, uh, you know, I want to be able to connect my ASR 9Ks. I paid a lot of money for those, more than my house. <laughs> and. Uh, almost no matter where you live, and, and I want to be able to connect my ASR 9Ks to my spine switches, okay? Well, in ACI, you can't. It's just not permitted. The miscabling protocol will stop that. So what you need to do is dedicate a pair of leafs to border leaf functionality. Now, you actually don't have to dedicate a pair of leafs. You can use these for hosts that are connected as well. That's perfectly legal, fine, safe, no problem. Typically, we want to dedicate them to a pair of border leafs as we're in large scale designs. And there's a number of good reasons for this from a scalability perspective, number of VRFs and spe specifically number of routing processes that we have running. We may even have multiple border leafs if we've scaled out very large. And from a small perspective, it's no problem. You want to add that, uh, you want to add the, the small host there or, or so, have many hosts as well as, you know, kind of full of hosts plus your routed links, that's not a problem. Okay, so on our border leafs, the problem is some people have a problem looking at this from a visual standpoint. They kind of can't get over that three-tier architecture that they're so used to. Well, that's not a problem. We can accommodate that with VXLAN and even ACI topology designs, and it's a mere exercise in Visio. So all we do is drag these leafs, up here and done. It looks like three tier. So let's just drag the enterprise or service provider network up. And to prepare it, then we'll drag the pair of leafs up. And it's a little kind of off center. So we'll go ahead and center it. And now these are still our border leafs. They are not connected to other leafs. They're not spine switches. They are leaf switches. They're just border leafs. And truthfully, they could still have hosts connected to them if we wanted. And at this point, it still looks kind of like our uh, three-tier topology, or this is our north to south traffic. And then we have our east to west traffic. And this is actually something I haven't mentioned yet, but this is one of the other major reasons for going to a full L3 equal cost multipath VXLAN type environment is not only 
so that we do away with spanning tree. In ACI and any VXLAN, there is no spanning tree because there's no L2, right? It's all L3 routed. In ACI, there's also no spanning tree south. It simply doesn't exist. Well, it doesn't exist on the leaf switch. The southbound, let's say this was a switch here, the southbound switch may have spanning tree running, but the northbound won't. And if we have a loop, we're actually going to talk about that in a future module, how the BPDUs flood, and it's not a problem. So, but another reason is the fact that our east to west traffic in our data centers has grown significantly. So it used to be that our north to south traffic accounted for about 80% of our bandwidth and about 20% of our bandwidth was east to west. Well, that's now been flipped on its head, and now it's about 20% of our traffic is north to south, and about 80% of our traffic, according to almost any industry uh, analyst out there, is east to west traffic. And so it's because of this that we need a shorter hop between, not only decreased latency, but a shorter hop, we need more bandwidth, more links forwarding, all links forwarding really. We, because that's the majority of our traffic, we don't want spanning tree TCNs to cause cam table floods, occasion, you know, uh, momentarily lose uh, packet loss or frame loss really at L2, and then to have to do possibly unknown unicast flooding, things of this nature. This really can slow down our east to west application traffic. It also allows us to overcome the issue with the number of VLANs being 4096 and many of those being reserved, so actually less than uh, 4,000 VLANs available, approximately 4,000 VLANs being available. If we have more layer two bridge domains than that, then we have a problem. There's ways around it in the traditional design, but they're kind of hacks or kludges with VXLAN as we're getting ready to talk about, we have a 24-bit ID, and so we can go up to millions of layer two bridge domains, and then we can also essentially reuse VLANs. So I could have 4,000 VLANs on this switch, and the same 4,000 VLANs could be over here, but they mean entirely separate bridge domains. So for instance, I could have VLAN ID, uh, let's say 10, okay, here on this leaf switch, and it's mapped to VXLAN VNI, let's say 100010. Over here, let's say on this leaf switch, I have VLAN ID 10, and I have it mapped to VNI 113729, okay? So it's mapped to an entirely separate VXLAN VNI. And I could still have that VXLAN either over here on this switch, but just mapped to a different VLAN or just mapped to a particular port. And again, now with ACI, I actually have VLAN IDs, not just per top of rack switch, but I actually now have them per port. And of course this is PPV, or per port VLAN. So I can actually reuse, now I can't have 4,000 uh, VLANs times 48, so I can't have like all the VLANs, but if I need to reuse any VLAN numbers, or I, I should say on a 9300, I'm not going to get 4,000 VLANs times 48 ports. Uh, that's a lot of VLANs. The TCAM space can't hold quite that many on a 9300. Maybe on a 9500 that would be fine. Uh, but what I can do is if I need to reuse many of my VLANs, I can do that just fine because I tell each port to go into per port VLAN mode. 